Our reading this morning comes from Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, and then chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies on Shaitan. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they'd come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she laid on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the man assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way. Chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So thank you, Margaret. I love the fact that technology enables those who can't be here physically can still participate in our service. In our morning services, as uh, Jill uh, reminded us, we're looking at a series of people from the Old Testament uh, who had a flawed faith, F-L-A-W-E-D. And today we come to an interesting scene where um, we, we're looking at Rahab and Joshua. Let me set the scene. Jacob and sons had left Canaan to join Joseph in Egypt quite a few hundred years before. Lots of tribes had then moved into the land that they had occupied and now they didn't want to move. But God had told the Hebrews that they would find a home again in the promised land beyond Jericho, the land that had originally been given to Abraham and his descendants. But it was always certain that they would have to reclaim the land by force. So we're now in the late Bronze Age, about 1400 BC. And the late Bronze Age was a brutal era of tribal warfare. God had miraculously brought the Hebrew people out of Egypt, out of slavery, under Moses. 
But because of a failure to trust God, Moses and his generation had died in the wilderness. And now we have Joshua and his new generation who are to occupy the land. Joshua appointed as the leader after Moses. And right now, they're on the border. They're ready to invade. So if you look at the map, hopefully you can see Jericho there, which is really important because it's guarding a gap in the mountains, a pass through which the invading army could go. Otherwise, they'd have a really, really rugged climb over the top of the mountains and down again. If they were going to reclaim the land, they were going to have to deal with Jericho. Imagine there was a bunch of armed soldiers outside the doors of this church and you wanted to come in. You'd have to get past them somehow. That's kind of what Jericho was like for the people wanting to go into the promised land. Now to see what sort of task they face, Joshua sent some spies into the city. And the passage here begins to read a little bit like a film script. Feels reminiscent of war movies where spies have gone behind the enemy lines and are hiding and will they get caught, won't they? The tension grows as they kind of sneak their way into the city. And the king of Jericho gets to hear that they're there and sets out to capture them, so the tension rises. The spies are hiding in Rahab's house and the tension goes up further. Will Rahab betray them when the soldiers knock on her door? She strikes a deal with them and then the soldiers are there. They're hiding on the roof under some bundles of flax. Will Rahab keep her word? Will she tell them, tell the soldiers where they are? You can almost hear the kind of the tension rising and the, the music getting more and more dramatic behind the scenes. And we hold our breath. And Rahab sends the guards on a wild goose chase and we oh, relax, the spies are safe. But the narrator here has used a really clever storytelling technique. A bit like some filmmakers. They've kind of shown us what's happened and then they go back and give us some more of the backstory about what actually happened behind the scenes up until the point we know that they escaped. So let's have a look together at Rahab, who had this flawed faith. And first of all, I want us to recognise that she was a heroine, albeit an unlikely one. Many of the women in the Bible have been treated badly by translators and by traditions. So, for example, Mary Magdalene in the New Testament has traditionally been portrayed as a prostitute. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that's true of her. It's a tradition that has grown up around her. Here, the Bible translators say that Rahab was a prostitute. But let's not be too keen to label her as a woman of ill repute. Because Josephus, who was an ancient Hebrew Jewish historian, calls her an innkeeper, not a prostitute. The difficulty we have is that in those days, the terms were interchangeable. They were equivalents. It's quite possible that she was running the equivalent of the Jericho Travel Lodge. Or she might have been offering more. We don't know for sure. But actually, regardless of her ethics and her profession, she didn't have a lot going for her. She was a single woman. We know that because when she told the men who was going to be rescued, she didn't mention a husband, she didn't mention any children. She ran a hostelry to earn a living, and in those days, people who ran a hostelry were open to at least raised eyebrows and, oh, I wonder what's going on there. People would have gossiped about her. And she was on the wrong side. As far as the Bible is concerned, she, would have, she was a citizen of Jericho. They were the baddies in this story. She was an enemy of the people of Israel. A really unlikely heroine in the Bible. But she took a step of faith. The people of Jericho were shaking in their sandals behind the walls of the city because they had heard all the stories of how God had led the people of Israel out 
of Egypt, through the Red Sea, destroying Pharaoh's army, through the wilderness, and now they were here on their doorstep. Knowing that the people served a God who could do all of that, and were now camped outside the city walls, led Rahab to decide that it was better to put her faith in their God than her king. She could see the way things were likely to go, and she decided that she would take a step of faith. Remember reason in a courageous mood from earlier on in the service? That's what Rahab did. She remembered the stories of all that God had done in the past. She talked with the spies, asked them for a promise that she and her family would be kept safe, and then took a step of faith, excuse me, <clears throat> then took a step of faith based on all of that reasoning and put her faith in God. Protected the spies, let them out of the city and trusted that they would keep their promise. And when it comes to our faith in God, we do apply the same sort of approach, reason in a courageous mood. Maybe we read or we remember passages from the Bible when people trusted God and he didn't let them down and we think, well, he can do the same for me. Or we recall a promise that he's made and he's kept in the past. Perhaps we're reminded of other people who, say, who tell us about how they trusted him and he didn't let them down. Or we have answered prayers that remind us that God is faithful. And it's actually often the same for people on a journey coming to faith in Jesus. They may read the Bible or be told about passages in the Bible and think, well, okay, maybe that's true. And they read about how much God loves them and how Jesus died on the cross for them and that they can be forgiven. Or maybe they think about family or friends who are Christians and they see something in them that they think, I want that. Maybe they just got this sense within them that this is the right thing to do. But whatever the reasoning, we still come to a point where we've got to do something about it. We've got to put that faith into action. I can have all the faith in the world that that chair is going to hold me, but I've still got to sit on it to prove it. Rahab believed that God would look after her, that she should trust him and his people, and so she took that step of faith. I don't know what's going on for you as an individual, what's going on for us as a church. There are lots of things happening. Maybe there are steps of faith that God is asking us to take. If there is, use reason in a courageous mood. Think about God's faithfulness in the past and trust him because if he has been faithful in the past, we can trust him for now and for the future. But we've still got to take that step of faith. So Rahab was an unlikely heroine who took a step of faith and she's important in God's plan. She protected the spies. Rahab and her family were kept safe within the wall when the walls of Jericho came down. The promise was uh, honoured and then she and her family <clears throat> were assimilated into the nation of Israel. She may well have thought that was the end of her story. Happy ever after. But actually her story continues. And we find out that she's a vital part of God's big plan for the whole of humanity. We're told that Rahab married a Hebrew man. I think his name is Salmon, but it's written down Salmon. So however you want. They had children. And a few generations down the line, her family tree leads to King David, Israel's greatest ever king. And if you follow that family tree even further, you find Joseph of Joseph and Mary fame, a descendant, ultimately, of Rahab. 
If you look at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, there's Jesus's family tree listed there. And family trees in Jewish tradition only usually mentioned the male of the line. <clears throat> Matthew is a little different. He mentions four women by name. One of them is Rahab. No way on earth could Rahab have imagined when she took that step of faith that she would be part of the family tree for God's Messiah. And strictly speaking, she shouldn't be in that family tree because, first of all, she was a woman and they weren't traditionally included. She was also a foreigner and they definitely weren't traditionally included. And there is this doubt about her former profession. She's a potential stain on Jesus' ancestry, but she's there. And I think Jesus would have relished the fact that she was there, given how he was with those around him who everyone else looked to exclude. When I see Rahab in Jesus' family tree and see how she formed part of God's big plan for history, it reminds me that God includes and uses people that we might exclude. We saw that time and again when we looked at some of Jesus' parables during the summer. We shouldn't be surprised at who God decides is in. And we should be careful we don't exclude people he would want to include. And as if to underline it and then highlight it in fluorescent yellow, the Bible has Rahab listed one more place. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11, there's a long list of what you might regard as spiritual superheroes from the Old Testament. And in the middle of that list is Rahab. The writer to the Hebrews says this, by faith the prostitute, his words, Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She's held up as an example of someone who exercised faith, who took reason in a, and in a courageous mood. She had no idea of any of that. And actually, that's often the, state, the case for us as well. We take a step of faith, but we have no idea about what the implications of that will be for us when we step out in faith, when we trust God. We may be surprised and delighted because we see it in front of us, or we may never see it in our lifetime. But what we have done might be a vital part of the mosaic that God is putting together in human history, the mosaic of faith. Rahab, an unlikely heroine who took a step of faith and is important in God's plan. But we're also going to look at Joshua, very briefly, I promise. We've been looking at flawed faith. And Rahab probably is somebody who we would regard as having flaws. But when you look at Joshua in the Bible, he gets a pretty good press. However, I think he still has flaws. And they were revealed in the small passage, the second one that Margaret read to us. You see, we jumped ahead to chapter five, where Joshua meets this armed stranger on the edge of the camp outside Jericho before they start the final attack. And Joshua asks this stranger, are you a friend or foe? Whose side are you on? Now the stranger is identifying himself as the commander of the Lord's army. And later as the conversation unravels in chapter six, he speaks on behalf of God, actually the voice of God through him. It would be fair for us to assume that he was on the side of the Israelites, wouldn't it? I'm pretty sure that's what Joshua would have thought. But the stranger says, when Joshua says, whose side are you on? The stranger says, I'm on neither side. Joshua had assumed that the choice was simple. You're either on our side or you're against us. But God's messenger had another perspective. God hadn't actually picked a side. He was on everyone's side. 
Jesus's followers have a similar experience. They stopped someone who was ministering in the name of Jesus, but wasn't part of their in crowd. And they came to Jesus and I get the sense that they were quite proud of themselves as they said to Jesus, we saw someone and we stopped him. Oh, we good. And Jesus looks at them and says, if they're not against us, they're for us. What I take from this, and it kind of reinforces one of those messages from God choosing Rahab, is that we should not try and predict God's ideas. We should not try and restrict God's choices. We shouldn't try and recruit God for our cause or to back our point of view. Rather, we should listen to what he says and then follow that. Now, let's be fair to poor old Joshua, that once he'd got his head around who it was in front of him, and he'd taken his sandals off, because it's another of those holy ground moments, he adapted to the situation quite well. We probably know the story of God's outrageous plan to take Jericho, which involved marching around the walls six days, once each day, and then the seventh day, seven times round. I don't think the plan was to make them all dizzy. I think if it had been left to Joshua, he might well have taken the traditional way of capturing a city in those days and laid siege to it. Starve them out. But God had other plans. What is all the marching round the walls of Jericho about? Well, I, I wonder, this is Nick's theory, okay? Was God offering an alternative way out for the people of Jericho? Each day, as the people march round, they would have been aware of the size of the army, and maybe each day they would have reminded themselves, a bit like Rahab said, we all know about what God has done for you in the past, and the writer says their hearts were melting in fear. Each day, was there an opportunity God was giving them to respond in the same way that Rahab had? Actually, to change sides, to put their faith in God rather than resist his people? Was God leaving the way open for them to surrender? It's not out of character for him. If you think about the story of Jonah, who's sent to the mega city of Nineveh to pronounce God's judgment on them and say that God's going to flatten the place, what did they do? They turned to God and they said, sorry, and God relented, God forgave. He allowed them to continue. Joshua had assumed that God was on his side, but God is on the side of all people. Rahab had seen that and turned to God in faith. What if this was actually God giving the rest of Jericho a final chance? I've got no evidence for that. It just feels like the sort of thing God might do. And the reason I think that is because I'm reminded through this passage that we should never try to put God in a box that we create out of our own limited faith or our own expectations of what God would or would not do. God does amazing things like including Rahab in Jesus' family tree. An unorthodox approach to taking a fortified city. And maybe he's asking you, maybe he's asking us to do things that we aren't expecting. But we shouldn't be surprised if he does. And instead of saying, well, he wouldn't do it that way, think about what he would do and step out in faith in trusting him. Before we sing again, let's just pause and pray. Lord, we thank you that you are on the side of all people, that you love every single person that you created. And we pray that you will help us to capture your imagination, not to restrict you in our thinking, in our planning, in our doing, in our saying. May we be willing to look beyond our own limited expectations with the eyes of faith 
and step out in faith, reason in a courageous mood, when you call us to follow. Amen.